Everybody warm? Nice and warm. Good. Well warmed up. So now, I want to start introducing some amazing people that are making this whole event possible. And we're going to start with the people who give us the place that we're in right now. Over there, she's, she's going to come up. I'm going to make her do it. That's Mary Baker from Microsoft. Please give her a, a warm round of applause. And she's going to tell you about something amazing that Microsoft does. Tell them about this part. Don't worry, I'm not going to sell you anything. Um, so welcome to Microsoft's New York office here in Times Square. How many of you ha have been here before? That's awesome. Okay, welcome back. And for those of you who haven't been here, welcome. Um, we have event Wi-Fi codes on the board. If you need Wi-Fi, we have it. Um, and I also just want to share a program with you for those startups in the audience. We have a program called BizSpark. It's B-I-Z-S-P-A-R-K um, dot com. And it's basically free software, pretty much everything that Microsoft makes for tech startups. So if you're interested, you can apply online at that web address. Um, and yeah, so my colleague Heather Shapiro is here to speak on the panel. And if you have any questions for me or Heather, um, we'll be kind of wandering um, during social times and feel free to come and bug us. What was that name again? Oh, BizSpark. Yes, it's B-I-Z-S-P-A-R-K dot com. If you're a startup, a tech startup, you should definitely apply. All right, that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Mary. Yeah, BizSpark, it's great. It's, they give you everything. Uh, I also want to um, talk about our platinum sponsor tonight. So we have an amazing new sponsor. Uh, it's a company called uh, Abis. So it could be Abis could be Ebis, it's A-E-B-I-S. I asked how they wanted me to pronounce it and they were like, we'll answer to anything including hey you. So uh, these guys, they do something very interesting. Their, their <clears throat> tagline is, it's, they're the knowledge transfer wizards, okay? And what they've done is they've developed a method for managing human knowledge and specifically for transferring that knowledge from person to person or even from person to machine. So this is the intersection of AI artificial intelligence and human intelligence. So these guys are great, platinum sponsor. Everything that you're enjoying tonight, they have helped to uh, make possible. So um, I invite you to stick around because after our panel discussion, uh, Bruce Epstein from Avis is going to be doing a post-panel fireside chat. Now, I don't know where the fireplace is, but it will certainly be, uh, are we doing it here? Out there? You're lighting fires in the hallway? Okay, oh, in New York City. There's a room called Radio City. Radio City, there's a room called Radio City, not the actual Radio City, so don't go to Radio City, because uh, there, well, there might be fires, but. Um, so that's gonna be at 8.30 uh, until nine o'clock. So thank you very much. Now, I also wanna mention some of other sponsors who are helping out tonight. Uh, there's Hint Water, so, and I think we actually have Hint people here tonight. <gasps> I heard a yes. Where are you? Raise your hand. I want to see a hint per Hey, very cool. So Hint, uh, they make the delicious water that you've been, you've been tasting. And I, I get to talk about them every single time, but I've never met one of them. So hello, Hint person. Uh, I love your water. Thank you. Very refreshing. And with just a hint of flavor. Um, <laughs> and we also have Funding Post. Now, Funding Post uh, have been contributing to those delicious gourmet sandwiches that you all ate too many of. Uh, so if you enjoyed those, think about Funding Post, right? And they're a group of people, um, it's a community bringing uh, together VCs and entrepreneurs. They have events uh, and publications. We love Funding Post. Uh, I also want to mention uh, Peloso Barnes. Uh, we've got Eric and Julia. I saw Eric was the very well-dressed man somewhere. Ah, there he is in the back. Uh, and I didn't see Julia. Is she here? Uh, oh, there you are. Beautiful. Um, so they're with uh, Morgan Stanley. So financial management, if you have any questions, you wanna plan your you know, billion dollar exit, they're the people to talk to, okay? Uh, we've also got Dana Stevens who provided us with that delicious wine. Uh, she's just a really nice lady. Uh, that's, that's what she does. Um, she's also a project manager here at Disruptive Technologists. So thank Dana if you see her. I, I, don't, I didn't see her, but she's here somewhere. Uh, and Major Minor Media, hi, hello camera. So they're the media sponsor tonight. They're the ones who are going to be producing an incredible video that you guys can all see later. Uh, I wanna mention Harry Greeley and his team. So with Harry is Jenna Cataloni, Catalone, Catalan? 
Catalan. Um, so they are uh, with Cushman and Wakefield. So commercial real estate. If you want to know anything about commercial real estate, you want to find commercial real estate, you want to understand how recoveries work. I don't know. Talk to those guys over there. They are our brilliant uh, commercial real estate consultants. Uh, and then we also have Outer Places. This is kind of an interesting one. So Outer Places uh, is a community where science meets science fiction. Uh, and they are going to be live streaming. Uh, so right now, theoretically, I'm on Facebook somewhere. There's somebody with a camera looking at me. Um, make me look good and extra funny. Where, where are you? Back there somewhere. Anyway, so we've got Facebook coming. And then finally, uh, we've got a media partner, Gary's Guide. Um, which is another resource and community around startups uh, and specifically with entrepreneurship and technology. So I think, did we find our, our ticket holders of, of Gary? Got? No? All right. Well, <clears throat> if you know Gary, tell him that we appreciate him you know, posting us and, and sending us lots of people who may not have shown up. But that's okay. With that, I'm going to turn the event over to our disruptive host, Mr. Kevin Pianco, he leads the technology practice in New Jersey for BDO. He's in assurance assurance not insurance apparently that's a very big difference um and he is going to be our moderator and is going to lead us in our amazing panel discussion for the evening um actually before i do that there's one other thing i want to do i want to give away some swag so where's sarah she ran to me last time sarah oh uh, she's probably out in the hall okay you do your thing i'll do it afterwards you want to get her? Get Sarah. Get her quick. Drag her in here with a bowl full of business cards. Come on. Three seconds. Two seconds. One second. And we're going to Kevin. She better run. Tell her to run. Run, Sarah. Come on, hoof it. Okay, very good. Big round of applause for Sarah. Thank you. Okay, here we go. I'm picking business cards. I've got Dynamo, Account Truth, Matt Apprendi. Where is he? Ha ha! All right, so stay there. Just find this lovely woman. She's going to get you something you know, delicious. Well, don't eat it. Okay, number two. Ooh, piece of paper. Eric Von Derhijen. <gasps> there he is. Say, say your name for me because. Vander Heiden. Vander God, I really messed that one up. Okay, well, Eric, <laughs> you find her. Okay, we're going to do two more, real quick. Okay, I'm not looking. Digging. Oh, ooh, this one feels good. <gasps> ooh, look at this. Loop Ventures. Wow. <laughs> really? Come on. You put your card in here? Well, okay. <laughs> It's a really that. cool card, though. All right, all right, come on, come on. We're going, we're doing it. We'll get you a t-shirt anyway. It's all right. Okay. Personal, work with the people who love what they do. Forest Solutions Group. Pancham Sharma. There you are. Okay, great. Love it. Very good. And last but not least. Oh, this is going to be the best. I can feel it. Ooh, I want some texture. Give me some texture. Jeffrey S. Berger, attorney at law. No! Oh, yay, look at that. Very good, okay. So, you will all each individually and collectively find Sarah. She's gonna get you uh, a lovely disruptive technologist t-shirt. With that, let me bring up Kevin. So just find them. Oh, here, I'll give you their names just so you know who they were. Thank you. This does not work. Yeah, I'll hold this. <laughs> Maybe you don't got one. Okay. This is most of yours. <coughs> All right, Lauren, should we have a timeout when a pizza gets here? Because you really don't want it to be cold. Um, it's gonna be here in about fifteen minutes. Okay. And the person who's coming up to bring it upstairs is going to walk up here and I get, I, I, yeah, I guess yeah. I'll say. Why don't we just pay, we'll hand a box on one end, on that end, we'll just let it slide together. How's that for everybody? Does that work? Okay.
<laughs> Who likes cold pizza? Anybody like cold pizza? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think the majority is we'll, as soon as it comes in, we'll try and disperse as quickly as we can. How's that? So David, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I, I'm always honored uh, to work with uh, Laura and her team here. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal organization she's developed here. And the crowd just keeps growing each time we have a presentation. So I can't thank you enough for allowing me to participate here. Uh, we have a great panel this evening. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, starting with Heather, and work our way down to Doug. Take one minute, oh, introduce minute. yourself. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Heather Shapiro. I'm a technical evangelist here at Microsoft, so I'm on Mary Baker's team. So what I do here at Microsoft, tech evangelist is kind of a weird term, but essentially I'm a software developer, and, but I work in the community. I don't have a specific product team that I work on, but I go out into the community. I work with students, startups, and developers in the community to help with proof of concepts, to help them put their own apps into production. So I work with a lot of our machine learning and artificial intelligence APIs, and so I'll be talking about those. I'm uh, Oliver Christie, I'm an AI consultant at Foxy Machine, and uh, we consult for some big technology companies, banks, insurance companies, advertising, um, on how they can use AI and potentially disrupt the market. Um, and at the moment, I'm building out an insurance company and a recruitment company, uh, which is centered on AI. Hi, my name is Bruce Weed. I work for IBM and I run a developer advocacy team in New York City. We focus on a lot of the bleeding edge technologies like blockchain, IoT, AI, and we help both enterprises as well as startups as well as university students to develop different products using those types of technologies on the cloud. Hi, I'm James Wang. Uh, I'm an analyst at ARK Invest. We're based in Chelsea. Um, we have a number of products uh, that's basically trying to answer the question of, you know, what, if you were to invest in the public markets, what's an easy way to uh, diversify and invest uh, in, in the, where the world is going? Uh, I focus on the internet side, so the two main areas of focus for our fund is uh, artificial intelligence and blockchain, similar theme, IoT as well. So uh, kind of, I guess, kind of in a way do what Doug is doing, but in the public sphere. Um, I was at NVIDIA before joining ARC for nine years. I did product and software in various capacities. Uh, really just a chip geek through and through for about 20 years. Doug. I'm Doug Clinton from Loop Ventures. So we're a venture capital company. We invest in companies creating uh, what we call the future of technology, frontier technologies. Uh, artificial intelligence for us is probably the number one theme of all the themes we focus on. Um, I think that artificial intelligence can be as transformative as the internet was over the past 20 years. I think it's more transformative than the smartphone. So really it could be the most important technological shift that I think we all see in our lifetimes. Um, and as James mentioned, I focus primarily on <laughs> privately held companies, um, anywhere from no money, a uh, team of two people with an idea to uh, companies that have raised $100 million and have big teams that are building uh, great products that we might all use today. I'd like to congratulate the panel right off the bat. It's the first time I had somebody really adhere to the limited timeline. That's great, thank you. Uh, we have about an hour and 10 minutes of, of time to discuss. If you have any questions, I'll try and scan the room on a regular basis. Just chat a little bit if I'm not seeing you and uh, try and get you involved in the, in the conversation here. But we will leave plenty of time at the end as well. Uh, so let's just, just start off with a general general uh, question. You know, let's talk about you know artificial intelligence, the successes we've seen to date. Uh, you know, maybe give some examples and, and where the biggest impact is, and what can we expect going forward. So anybody could take the shot at this one. Get the ball rolling. I can go first. I think Doug. Thank you. One that probably everybody in this room has used to some degree is Netflix. I mean, I think that's maybe one of the most obvious examples. Um, so I think this might have been. It's less than ten years ago, but probably more than five. Netflix held a competition to help improve their recommendation algorithm. Um, and I think they were really one of the first companies to go out in the market and ask for help trying to figure out uh, how to better leverage machine learning, big data, and then machine learning um, to enhance their recommendations for us as we all watch movies. Um, so now if you watch Netflix, they've done away with sort of the rating system and they give you a percentage match of how likely you are to like a very specific movie. So the ratings that they used to have were the same for everybody. Everybody saw the same ratings. Now they're trying to give you very specified 
um, recommendations based on your prior viewing habits, things that other people have viewed that you have viewed that they may have liked. Um, so I think Netflix is probably a really great example. Google, I think, is the company that's probably um, the most advanced artificial intelligence company of any company in the world today. Sorry, Microsoft. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that where they are today, what they've invested in, the companies they've bought, the research they've done, um, you know, it touches every product you use on Google today. Your search results are enhanced by artificial intelligence. Um, Gmail is enhanced by artificial intelligence. Siri and our assistants that we use uh, with voice are enhanced by artificial intelligence. So it's really all around us, I think. Um, and, it, and it's, um, I think, so pervasive. Like, we use it and we don't even know it. We're, we're all, I think, touched by AI today in some way. It's a bit challenging as an investor, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard, yeah. Um, maybe I'll just carry on what Doug is saying. Uh, I, I think, you know, one of the things that's happened is that the camera, the cost of a camera, has has basically dropped to approximately zero. Uh, any anywhere where you can have a small CMOS sensor is basically the call it your eyeball, uh, and that that the side effect is being that photography is actually just exploded. You know, we now take pictures without even thinking about it. Um, these cameras are everywhere on our phones, mostly. Um, but when Apple launched the iPhone X, I had this thought, which was kind of a stretch, but maybe there's, there's a germ of an idea in there, is that up to this point, uh, the digital camera in our smartphones, in our webcams, can only <coughs> merely capture what you see. It never understood of anything, so it was merely a record. It had no uh, comprehension. And what deep learning, the specific branch of AI that's kind of taking off right now, is, um, is allowing us to do is, for the first time, computers can actually understand what it's seeing. You can debate academically what understanding means, but literally it can, you know, one Microsoft demo that, that I thought did very well was, um, it's not just a matter today of, of having a picture of a cat and it says cat. We're at the level where you can provide a full natural photograph and it can semantically label a beautiful woman is running on a sandy beach. Um, even if you have a very skeptical view of AI, that's a shocking amount of understanding, I think. Uh, so, getting back to the Apple chip, uh, the, the, the Apple uh, iPhone 10, uh, I don't know if you read it, but they basically put a neural net accelerator inside the A11 chip. Uh, and that's now wired to the same camera that's in the front, that's the, that little front-facing thing that sees your face, so it can actually understand how you're <coughs> looking. Uh, no matter what angle you are, what kind of lighting it is, it can actually understand it is seeing you and unlock the phone without, without a button. Um, now, where am I going here? Well, I think it's kind of, um, if I were to be a little bit extravagant, I would say with just a standard camera and CMOS sensor, uh, humanity has built kind of an artificial version of the eye, but without any of the brain circuitry. Uh, with the iPhone 10 now wired to the A11 chip, you've basically built the whole visual cortex, including the back of your mind. So um, one thesis that we have that's kind of a working thesis is everywhere there is a camera, there's going to be a CMOS chip underneath. And after that is going to be an inference processor, so you can actually understand what you're seeing. Uh, so within a few years, uh, every camera that you're using, wherever it is, will literally be um, a kind of scaled down version of your, your eyes, your whole optical system, down to the visual cortex. And you can literally, for computers, to understand what it's seeing. That's just happening right now. But I think once you scale that to two, three billion internet users, it's going to be pretty dramatic. Great, thanks. Bruce? So I, th I think when you look at AI and where it's going, you can look at it from two different spectrums. It's not that unsimilar if you take your smartphone today. There's applications you can run on them that are very good and productive, and then there are other applications. I don't mean to pick on Snapchat, but I will for a minute, right? They're there, they provide a function, but they're not solving world peace, right? So I think when you look at AI, you're gonna actually see it implemented in both categories. So as an example, Lauren had put in the meetup, she talked about Chef Watson, right? Kind of a fun thing to do with AI, figure out how can I mix different recipes. There's nothing wrong with that, right? As a matter of fact, there may be some neat things that come out of that, food palettes, all of a sudden you're tasting something, wow, this is kind of really neat. And what it is, if you look at most chefs today that are out there in the world, they can use like maybe five ingredients max that they put in as far as spices and herbs and things of this nature. Watson can do like 15, 20 and do all these different kinds of mixes. So on that side, again, fun stuff, kind of neat, you know, may have some benefit down the road, particularly as you apply that to the health aspect. But the real transitional thing I think for AI is really how can it help mankind? And this is where we get into AI 
like we see with Watson in the healthcare arena, right? So we're working with Sloan Kettering to figure out how can we figure out better treatments for cancer, figure out what exactly types of things uh, are being done worldwide, analyzing that data, and then figuring out what are the best options for the doctor. So I think that's, you know, we need to look at it from a broad spectrum. You'll see some instances where AI is implemented, like I said, more for fun, and then some more on the, on the serious side. But I also think this concept of the visual part of it is not one that people relate to right now as much, right? A lot of it right now is about chatbots and understanding text, speech to text, text to speech. But the whole visual aspect, I think, is where it is gonna become extremely powerful. And this plays back into when you look at you know, robotics and robots, we have a robot called Pepper and it does rely on visual. It'll actually look at a person and it'll figure out the person in front of them is a man, you know, 60 years old, Caucasian, blah, 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 and, and start to do that type of analysis. And that can be very helpful if, again, that person is, that robot is greeting that person to facilitate some type of service, right? Maybe they're a greeter at an airport. So they're able to find out, hey, what kind of help do you need? And they'll be able to do that type of analysis. So I think there's going to be a broad spectrum of uses of AI. And I think all these other you know, technologies that exist today, some of them individually on their own, are going to be combined together with AI to make it really something very powerful. Oliver? So I'm going to rift on all three and say, firstly, the Netflix example is fantastic in that it gives us a practical example of how AI is going to improve our lives. It means we binge watch a lot more, but we watch the stuff we want. I think that's fantastic. It's AI which is effectively invisible. On to cameras. Um, the cameras we have in our smartphone are better and better all the time, but up till now they've been effectively dumb. Um, and then in terms of um, world peace, the health problem, the, the let's make a, a powerful impact. I think some of the work being done um, with image recognition and cancer detection is fantastic. This year, 2017, we can now um, detect skin cancer earlier and better than a human using our smartphone. And this is thanks to AI um, and fantastic image recognition and the right data set. 98% of us will get cancer at some point, we'll get some type of skin cancer at some point. We can now detect it earlier with our smartphone. So I think that's a, a very, you know, it's a great first step in terms of health. But health is complicated and IBM has had some issues with trying to take on too much. It's a really hard subject, um, but it's fantastic. That's what we're trying to tackle. On the other hand, I have a problem with Chef Watson. Um, I, think, uh, I, think, I think the end results are interesting from a scientific and engineering point of view, but I still feel, so I've tried it enough. Um, the data was pulled from about the recipes on About Me, which are um, personal, just regular sort of recipes. Um, and the results are interesting, but not very good. I think the results are very interesting from an engineering point of view, but from a chef's point of view, they fail because we don't have the domain no, uh, knowledge there. So I used to be a chef. I um, ended up as a Michelin starred chef uh, back in the UK. And uh, while the results aren't amazing, the questions they ask are. So I think the technology is very, very impressive. And I think the end result is interesting in a different way. Thank you. Yeah, and going off of what everyone has said, there's obviously so many different realms where AI can enhance our lives. And one thing that I've been very interested in recently is with accessibility and how artificial intelligence can increase accessibility for in presentations, just in our everyday lives. So um, you mentioned that in with OCR or image recognition, they can just tell that, oh, there's a girl running across on the beach. Um, they can pick out colors, they can pick out so many different things, but even things with like PowerPoint, there's now an extension that will allow you to do a custom speech recognition model on your entire PowerPoint, and you can translate your speech into any language mid-speech, like in real time, so that people can see the transcript right there, right then. So it's something that's very powerful and that people haven't 
necessarily seen and it doesn't always get it right we know that artificial intelligence is growing but it it's creating that model based on your notes based on your slides and it can figure out what you're trying to say it puts it online it allows people more access to this and it allows more people to be able to listen to you understand what you're saying you can put it into so many different languages um, where they can translate it and also as like a crowdsourcing thing so there's so many different ways that we can combine artificial intelligence into accessibility measures, and I think that will be a really powerful way um, to see go forward. Kevin, I would, I would add one. I'm, of so I'm sorry, Pete's is here. We're just. Pete's here, but I don't know how you want to do it. Let's take a vote. Who wants to go grab a slice of pizza right now? Can you do it in two minutes and get back? Let's do it in two minutes and come back. Okay, we're gonna kick this thing back up. Yes, but no, I completely agree. I think it's gonna be short. Phone? Too loud? What's that? You'll call me. You'll call me. Yeah, it was basically writing graphics cards, GPUs. That was my first article in a freelance. This is my first job. That was my first job. My second job was working in Nvidia, so promoting. Hey, we're gonna have service, folks. Folks, can't get out of this racket. I took a chance. Don't make me look bad. We want to get this thing back up and running. Uh, Giovanni's going to be handing out slices when they come back in. So we'll put them in the back. You can probably smell the slices when they come in. Put a hand up, he'll run it over to you. How's that? That work? Good. Okay. Folks, come on. Let's get back here. All right. Give us a chance. Be respectful of our panelists because they're taking their time to be here tonight. Doug, you want to continue with what you're going to say? Sure. Yeah, I was just going to add to um, to James's discussion earlier about vision. Um, which, thank you. Which is, um, if you think about human uh, senses, there's a statistic that basically 70% of all the information we consume around us in the world is from our sight. So the rest of our senses only make up 30% of what we consume in terms of information in the world. So it stands the reason that vision, replicating vision is probably the most important problem we can solve with artificial intelligence if we're trying to replicate human productivity. Um, and I think that you know, if you think about the applications for vision with AI, it's self-driving cars is the most obvious and probably transformative one. But I mean, it's monitoring security footage, it's uh, robotics that work in factories, it could be robots that work alongside us in our homes. Um, all these applications, sorry. Oh, no, no, for me, like, uh, there's no more clean plates, there's better. more pizzas coming, so. Yeah, here too. Um, but anyway, uh, I think the vision piece to James's point is that uh, is probably again the most important piece that we can figure out as we apply AI to all these potential use cases in the future. <laughs> Doug, what's your fund seeing as far as opportunity to invest? Yeah, look what are you looking at right now? We look at broadly everything. Um, I think artificial intelligence for the self-driving car space is super hot. I mean, the automakers are way behind. I think where they need to be. Um, so, is this the feedback here? you're talking. About? Um, sorry. I guess maybe for pizza we might need large, no? <laughs> <laughs> good. Yeah, that's good. That's Speaking good. Speaking of pizza, I think Domino's is actually uh, a very good AI company. They have a good, <laughs> they have a good bot for ordering pizza. Ironically enough. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Um, so what, what we're seeing is um, the automakers, I think, are really way behind. Um, and they, the only way they can catch up to Tesla, who's probably furthest ahead, specific to... Yeah, should we just wait for that to clear up? Or? Yeah, let's give it a sec. Yeah. Is that better? Test, test, test. Okay. How's that? I think that's better. All right. Okay. okay. Sorry. Well, so I think it's going through that again, maybe. Is there a way to turn that off? Well, let's try. Go ahead. Um, anyway, so artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, uh, Tesla's probably the furthest ahead. I think the automakers need to spend a lot of money to acquire some of the talent that's sort of been building their own products in the space. Um, I think that's the only way they can catch up and be competitive with Tesla uh, in probably the next three or five years. So I'd say that's one space that we're spending a lot of time on in the AI field. Um, to give an example, I mean, you talk about the automakers being behind in general. What type 
Are you going after the OEM for parts, or what, what type of opportunities are you looking for in that space? But I'd say there's, there's really two opportunities for AI and self-driving cars. There's the sensors and there's the software. Um, so on the sensor side, typically you're working with uh, some sort of a LiDAR, a camera array. Some companies are using only basically like a $10 camera off a smartphone. Um, most applications for self-driving cars also include a LiDAR right now. Um, and then sometimes there's a third sensor that they include in that. Uh, the sensor space I think is pretty crowded though. I don't think there's a lot of opportunity to invest um, in the sensors themselves. I think it's more in creating products with that, or with that sensor hardware, whether it's the full end-to-end -end car or the software that utilizes the data from the sensors to power the self-driving mechanism on the car itself. All right, thanks. James, you got, um, yes sir. Uh, I was just gonna ask like, so I have trouble finding out how Google's gonna play in the self-driving car space. Uh, like they're not gonna make the car, oh thank you. They're not gonna make the car, right? So you see that as like a software as a service type play? Like where are they going with Waymo? I can give a quick take on that. I, so they are, uh, they have made a car that has literally no steering wheel. Uh, and they've been testing that. Uh, whether they make that in mass production or not, it's hard to say. I think that they definitely want to own the software layer for fleet transportation. So if you think about the opportunity that Uber's really secured, they're the best fleet transportation company in the world right now. Um, and I think that both Google and Tesla see an opportunity to sort of disrupt that field um, with their software-based plays. Uh, so I think fundamentally, Google's a software company. If they feel that they need to use hardware or create hardware products to deliver that software in a compelling way to consumers, I think they will. Um, but I think they're mostly focused on the software and the hardware sort of, you know, optionality for them at this point. I don't know if anybody else has a different take on that. Yeah, I'll dive in. I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, Google is absolutely a software company. That's what they do. That's what they do really very well. Um, Products are mixed with Google. Some are great, some are not so great. Um, we don't all use Google Wave at the moment because it sucked. We also didn't use Google Plus particularly. It isn't their market, it isn't the domain they know. Um, physically making a car is actually incredibly hard. Um, and it's very hard to make something that we would actually want to drive or drive us. So yes, they can make a self-driving car, but People like BMW, um, Mercedes, Ford even, have been around for so long building the hardware of a car. Um, why would Google want to compete there? It would be a losing battle. Google can make the software and sell that easily to everyone. Yes, sir, in the front row here. Yeah, if you just look at the chassis of a Tesla, 90% of the cars are there. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, let me say this again. <clears throat> If you look at the chassis of a Tesla, about 90% of a conventional car has just disappeared. Yeah. So there's plenty of room for Google or any other tech company to take on Detroit right now. And in fact, the disruption here is that these technologies are, are, are eating out 80% of, of the <coughs> traditional hardware in practically any industry that's like car. I mean, you know, where car is an analogy. So um, the real conversation here is um, where are those jobs and replacement opportunity where are those jobs going to go and where the replacement opportunity is going to come from because um, if you want cars I mean look self-driving cars are great but they're not going to happen until municipalities have some way of correcting for, for error so the opportunity obviously is in having massive oversight uh, at the road level so let's talk about the big future here, because I mean, this, we've seen tech, I've been in AI in, since the 80s, and most of the AI dreaming stuff uh, was replaced by, you know, like for example, language. You had all these brilliant people coming up with uh, semantic networks to produce better uh, language uh, recognition, and then a couple of people came up with a uh, statistical method of, of, of going through databases, that's Google. So a lot of this AI stuff is just overwrought. And the simple stuff works. So I just, you know, you brought up something where there's like a really practical answer to this. So could you find some more solutions, some more examples where what's we the, have this type of replacement? Uh, say, what's the question that you really the, want to have? The question is, what are we going to do when 80% of, of the old world disappears? 
And why wouldn't Google or, or new companies come along and just eat Detroit's lunch? Well, yeah, I mean, one thing I would caution you on, right, you know, when, when you look at a business, right, the, the business leaders are analyzing, and one thing you gotta be real careful of, what is your core business? Last time I checked, Google's core business is not making cars, it's software, right? So you gotta be real careful of that. It's not to say they couldn't go out and start making cars, it doesn't mean they're gonna be successful. And I think if you look at Google, as you pointed out, there's a, there's a kind of hit or miss there, right? There's some devices they've come out that have been really good, and then others, not so much. Uh, you would think intuitively, right, let's take the you know, smartphone. Geez, Google should have the best smartphone, right? Why not? I mean, it's, it's their operating system running the bloody hardware, but that's not the case, right? So you gotta take a step back and look at it from that perspective. It's not just as easy as saying, well, because they dominate here, they can start just doing whatever they want. Um, and when you look at Tesla, coming from a totally different backdrop, right? Because not only in terms of the way they think, but the businesses they've been in, Again, totally different approach than some more traditional companies been focused historically on more on the software side. So I think that's the, the play there. Um, I do think the uh, traditional automotive manufacturers don't count them out so quickly. Um, these people are not stupid, I will tell you, right? You take people at Mercedes-Benz, they have a lot of innovation over 100 years. They've come out with different things. A lot of their high-end cars, you know, their S550, I mean, the stuff that's on there is mind-boggling today. So I don't, I don't think it's, I just wouldn't rule them out as, as quickly as you think. So that, that would be my commentary. Sir, I'll come to you a sec. Yes, yes. What about Apple? And there's a company with software and hardware. So I'll, I'll just bring that up. Now, I don't know any truth to it, but rumors Apple is working on a car. It's supposedly hush-hush. You know, who knows? Uh, I don't work for the company, so I can't speak officially or unofficially, but there are rumors of that. But that would be a good example, because they do do both sides of it. They do focus Great on design. hardware, and they also do the software. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi. Yeah. As you take the mic over, I was going to say one thing that's interesting to think about for artificial intelligence uh, having an impact on the physical world. To affect the physical world, you have to do hardware in some way. So for Google, the Google example, they either have to build their own car or partner with somebody that has a car, right, to, to transport human beings. I think Apple's core competency is design. Google's is software, Apple's is design. They make the best, most simple, beautiful, usable products in the world. So it might make sense for them to do hardware. But I think for all artificial, uh, artificial intelligence applications, you have to think about what is sort of the end expected result, and then how do you deliver that result through the software. And in a lot of cases, it requires some sort of hardware, whether that's a robot in a factory uh, that takes in all the sensor data and then applies it to the real world, or if it's a car, or even just a speaker that sits on your, you know, your desk that answers your questions. Uh, there's always kind of a hardware component to it, so I think that's great. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep, great. Thank you. Um, from an investment standpoint, I think this question may be for James or Doug <clears throat> or whoever uh, has a comment from the panelists. So, so AI has been a buzzword the last couple of years, and particularly I would say it's catching, you know, changing a lot of uh, the ways we live in, in a lot of different ways, more subtle than others. From your perspective, from an investment standpoint, what you can see that will become more fruition and more ripe for investment opportunity, not something that's going to pay out in 10, 20 years. But more immediate in the sense, I'm not saying one year or two years, but more immediate, where do you see the greatest opportunity from an investment standpoint in the AI applications? Thank James you. And I, James and I were just talking about that before we, before we came up, so it'd be a good question, timely. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, for, for the public sphere, uh, you know, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit tricky. We, you know, I, I worked on a white paper look, trying to answer that question, actually, to figure out what's the, the opportunity for AI as an investment opportunity. I started out with AI, and very quickly, I, I reduced it only to deep learning, because the first obvious answer that, that you arrive at is, what is the AI breakthrough that everyone is talking about? It's actually deep learning and pretty much nothing else. There's been no breakthrough in you know, support vector machines or genetic programming or anything like that. Those have been around for a long time, but they didn't take off. Uh, so my first line of question was, what is the size of the opportunity? It's funny that Doug's intro is almost like parallel and I'm sure independent of, of our executive summary, which is over a 20 year period, we think it is an internet scale opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at what was the contribution of the creation of the internet um, 
just the S&P 500. I mean, in 20 years ago, 2000, well, when I wrote the paper, so it would be 26, 2000 and 1996, um, if you look at tech or internet's contribution, it was 0% of the S&P 500. And now the most valuable companies on, in the S&P 500 are internet companies. Uh, the total contribution turns out to be about 9%. So over two decades, you can contribute a foundation of technology can, can add about 10% you know, to the whole US large cap uh, system. Today, the investment opportunities are already in the household names we already know. Um, it's a bit sobering, but it's the same FANG stocks, you know, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, these guys, uh, that are the best AI companies because they are the ones that have amassed the greatest amount of data and the greatest amount of tech competency in both, in both algorithms and, and orchestrating them in a data center. So um, at, at that layer, it's, it's kind of large cap internet. There are, um, you can invest at the hardware level. Um, NVIDIA has been a name that's on fire. We've, we've owned that in our funds for a number of years. Uh, and they seem to continue to actually, NVIDIA, NVIDIA they, they mm -hmm. produce the GPUs that basically have a complete monopoly on, on deep learning training. Every time there is a deep learning algorithm, it's trained on NVIDIA GPUs. They have as much share there as Intel has in, in, in the data center. Um, but uh, really, I, I, I blame the lack of names, of fresh names on Doug, because <laughs> his companies haven't graduated. So why don't you tell us? Uh, yeah, it's a good way to put it. Yeah, I think um, James's point, most of the, if you think about the benefits accruing to specific companies from AI, I think Google, IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, I mean, they'd be at the top of my list in terms of companies that are providing platforms for others to build artificial intelligence services on top of. Um, so I think they're going to be probably some of the biggest winners. It's just going to be hard to see it because they're already so big. Um, in the private space, the way that we kind of think about opportunities for investment, there's kind of like three tiers. There's the uh, hundred plus billion dollar potential exit opportunity. So the next Uber, basically. There's kind of the, call it 10 to $50 billion type exits, which are like a LinkedIn or a Salesforce to give you an idea of scale. And then there's companies that are like 500 to a billion dollar type exits. Uh, and those happen every day, believe it or not. Um, and I think that if you think about those three tiers, there are a ton of companies in the 500 to a billion dollar exit space that are gonna get acquired by big companies, big traditional companies that need to add AI to their business processes because in the future, AI is the only way you compete. You can't compete on human capital in 10 years. You won't, you can't, uh, you can't beat human being, or you can't beat machines doing what humans are trying to do, right? Um, so I think that all these companies, these old tech companies, they need to add AI specific to their business cases and they need to own it because those differentiations are gonna be how they compete in the future marketplace. So they're gonna have to buy up all this low tier. That means we're not gonna have a lot of stuff in that kind of middle tier. And there's gonna be very few companies that break through to that top tier because Google and IBM and Microsoft and companies like that are already so effective at kind of the high end opportunity, which is probably something called artificial general intelligence, which is replicating human level intelligence essentially. Um, so unless a startup can kind of get to that, which is sort of the pinnacle really right now of AI, and then we go to super intelligence and you can talk about crazy philosophical things. Um, that's the only opportunity I think for these huge hundred billion dollar type exits um, in private companies with AI. Great, thank you. I want to get Heather involved. Heather, you know, he, Doug talked a little bit about the tangential piece of replacing human capital. What, what's your thoughts on ethical concerns that may exist with AI? So we don't really talk too much about, excuse me, ethics when it comes to, <clears throat> comes to AI. Only recently, like Elon Musk was like, we have to start making laws about, around artificial intelligence. And before that, no, there wasn't, there's not a lot of talk about it. Um, and to me, that's crazy because when you're thinking about even just self-driving cars, there's one person who's making this model, right? Like there's so many different ways that you can put bias into a model and you're dependent on that person's perspective. So there's so many ethical concerns just in that, but then in the legal aspect, when it comes to, we were just talking about this, like the skin, the skin cancer app, if it tells me I don't have it and I do, I'm sure, yeah, there's a little tag that says like, go see your doctor, but is that enough? Once companies start relying on artificial intelligence to actually give their customers advice and tell them what to do with their money or investments, different things, at what point does legal have to step in? At what point um, can we really trust them as customers or as the clients and 
what do we do around that? How do we start putting laws in place to actually get these things up in motion? Even with self-driving cars mm -hmm. also, like we can't have those until all cars are, like no one is driving because if one person is driving, then that eradicates all the, the work of the self-driving car because there, now there's now there's like the um, people people causing different things and you don't know what could happen from that. And so we need laws to, we need to be talking about the laws behind it and like what can actually be done um, behind the ethical concerns and then just legally what has to be done. I'm gonna take the counterpoint, which is to say um, we don't care. We don't care about ethics because we don't care about ethics at the moment with our technology one bit. Um, I think the, the news last night with uh, that horrific incident in uh, Las Vegas shows how little we care about human life and that we put um, company profits way ahead of human life. And Excuse me, Oliver, can I ask you a clarifying question? Yeah. Are you saying you don't care as a reality point? Or you say you don't, we don't care because that's just the way it is. We really don't care. I think um, in reality, what's playing out is we don't care. I think in, in inside teams, and I've talked to quite a few people inside Watson, for instance, and they're deeply committed to ethics. They're deeply committed to doing the right thing. I think the technology companies, all the engineers I've talked to, data scientists and so on, all want to do the right thing and build the right thing. IBM, Google, Microsoft are no different. When it gets out into the world, it's about money. And uh, I think Elon Musk brought up some ideas around should we be allowed to have autonomous killing machines? Well, we've kind of got them already. We've got drones which do exactly that. But we're also in an arms race with um, companies, like, uh, companies, countries like China and Russia who are also developing enough AI, it's unreal. So I think if we, we should have an ethic, we should have a question about ethics and about the society we want. Um, but I think just saying it's centered around AI is somewhat of a red herring. It's gonna be kind of a challenge for, for our legislators because on one component, they need it allegedly, as they say, they need to defend our country, right, and our way of life. <laughs> yeah, on the other side, they're going to say, how do you say this, how do you give the contrary view to the traditional consumer? All right, so it'll be an interesting dialogue. It'll be interesting to see what the Hill has to say on something like that. I haven't heard anything what's going on with that, but uh, yes. I was going to say, sorry. Go ahead. I want to interrupt you. There's a question over there. Uh, there was, per yes, sir, they'll come right over to you. Uh, I just wanted to understand for the healthcare perspective, right? What is the limit? Where do we see in 10 years? Because I imagine myself not going to doctor in five years. Is it possible unless there is a life threatening cancer? Heather, would you mind taking next? I know you're dealing with the hearing impaired. Would you mind calling mm -hmm. sharing that first? Were you meant repeating what the last part of the question was? Like, I just want to understand what is the limit, right, for the healthcare? Like, uh, how far we can go till I don't have to visit the doctor or the hospital? How far it that away? Um, well, I think legally you always have to have that like that disclaimer saying, "Well, this is not a doctor. Like this person, like you can't just trust what this app says." I was recently working with Cornell Medical School, helping them um, figure out cancer variants, and their main thing was we have to have this huge disclaimer saying, "This isn't telling you that you have this cancer or this this type." This is just giving you like information. It may or may not be accurate or relevant to you. Um, so where we're at right now is this: everyone's really trying to. While we don't necessarily care about the ethical concerns, everyone also doesn't want to be sued. Um, so companies are just trying to cover their backs for the most part. Be like, how can we say, in the best way, like, well, like this is the best that we think we can do, but. I mean, don't trust it all the way. It's not 100%. Um, so it's how do we figure out what is the best way to phrase that? What is actually, like, how le how legally responsible are we if people actually do not go to a doctor now because they have this kind of app? Is that the customer's fault or is that the company's fault? Because, well, maybe it was only, like, size 12 font and they didn't see it. It was, it was hidden. Um, you know, like things like that. There are no standards of what actually needs to be done in, um, around AI. 
Anybody else want to comment before I get yeah, to the next I'll, question? Yeah, I'll dive in. Um, on the positive side, the advances could be incredible. Um, actually, a lot of what Watson is doing in terms of health is fantastic. Um, they had a hiccup with the um, A.M. Anderson project. But you know what? The technology and the approach was smart, was good. The biggest issue we've got is um, not necessarily the technology side, but the data side. Getting access to data, pharmaceutical data, medical data, in the US and New York right now is hard. The clinicians want to, want to share it because guess what? If we all shared our data, we would get to a cure for cancer much, much, much quicker. If we don't, it's going to be slower. That's going to be the bottleneck. There's enough people working on this that we can get there, and the, the um, results are going to be amazing. But you will find it won't be everything all at the same time. It'll be individual uh, diseases, individual things, which will get done uh, one by one. But the overall effect, 10 years' time, we're going to be in a very different place, I hope. And I think a lot of schools now are really open to the idea of, like, collaborating with other medical schools. Mm. Um, like Cornell specifically, they have all of their, everything open source, so any, all of their technology that they're working on like, is open so that other schools who are doing similar research, they just want to find the cure. They want to find, figure out what is going on. They don't care who figures it out. They would prefer it to be them, obviously, but if they can help advance science, that's what's going on, so that's what they want. And so by putting it open, putting things on GitHub, putting like all over um, online and making this available to people and like making the data more readily available, even before with like Netflix, like they Netflix crowdsourced an algorithm. How if we work together to find that um, to find the perfect solution, then it's more doable. You can do it faster. Um, so a lot of schools are taking that approach nowadays. Come back to you, sir. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. In the back, yes. So I appreciate the ethical comment really at the macro level. On the micro level though, um, when we think about what AI does at the individual consumer level, and you were talking about the iPhone 10, um, you know, really taking it further. Um, the EU has the data protection, the cons individual consumer data protection, and I know it's like general data protection. Um, so they seem to be ahead of the United States, um, or, uh, and I don't know about other parts of the world. Um, are we going to see, uh, this isn't a political discussion, this is much more of given the dysfunction here, that will the EU, I mean, they're clearly taking the lead today. Are we going to see them continue to take the lead and, and become the beta for how this works? I mean, particularly in the face of Equifax, right? And all the breaches, Sony, and we can keep going on and on on every breach. So just curious on, let's, I mean, this question is much more on individual consumer. This gentleman was asking about healthcare. So as all these companies have more and more data on each individual, and it's Google, and it's Apple, and you know, whoever's gonna have healthcare and IBM, um, if they have these laws in Europe, will they default to the US or the US will be open yeah, that's season? A I, I think the way the GDRP, the European laws are structured is, um, I believe even if you're a European citizen and you're overseas, say you live, in, you live in the United States, I think that still gives you protection. I'm not 100% on that. But if that's the case, I think that opens up to a scenario where um, that may become a global default because the cost of implementation is so high that for a Google or a Facebook, um, the fact that they have to implement it for all of EU and all the people who are from the EU but outside, um, they may just take a much more aggressive stance than they've done traditionally. Uh, it's, it's hard to speculate on these things, obviously. But um, the, given the amount of pressure right now, every time you open the, the, you know, any newspaper, it's, it's basically pressure on Facebook, Twitter, Google on, on this kind of thing. I would not be surprised if one of them took a much more aggressive stance and, and gave a, the, a consumer 
a consumer-facing tool that lets you manage all your data, that lets you delete your presence. Mm -hmm. I think given the importance of imagery, especially facial recognition, there are already startups that's experts in basically masking, um, identifying your, your uh, face in public. I think there's gonna be a growing pressure to wanna be able to delete your, essentially, especially your facial profile off the internet. But we'll have to see how that evolves. Yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. The other gentleman was talking about profits. And so even though they, the EU might be the standard because it defaults over to the US, they may look at US citizens and just say there's so much money to be made off of every citizen outside of the US, right? It's, it's still valuable for us to run these two separate defaults yes. for geography. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I was, I was uh, moderating a panel last week on FinTech. And they were talking about the privacy blockchain technology is going to probably take over as a big significant component of that. Um, yes, sir. And, OK, I'll bring you a mic. Let me just, uh, so we can get through these Before. quickly, let me remind you that a question is about 12 to 15 words, starts with an interrogative, and ends with a question mark. <laughs> That's great. Perfect. Perfect timing. Wait, I'll use three of the words already. Um, uh, this is actually a, a question about, uh, just to change the scale slightly, um, not about self-driving vehicles, not about curing cancer, but what do we see the advancements in computational understanding in AI? And specifically, I'm most familiar with the Watson uh, approach in, in sentiment analysis and most recently announcements in tone analysis for audio files. Um, how do we feel that these emerging technologies have a subtle but important impact in the development of businesses? Bruce, can you answer that question? I know you're very into the LinkedIn profile on groups and stuff like that. Can you maybe share what's going on in that profile in response to this question as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so a couple, couple of thoughts around that. If, if you look at the sentiment analysis and also the tone analysis that's being done, um, it can be used for anything from on the business perspective. A lot of companies are using that type of technology to detect fraud. So when people deal with other countries and they use certain language, certain words, that stuff gets picked up. Um, also in terms of things like tone analysis, um, hedge funds are using that to detect if, if a CEO gives a quarter uh, report out, they pick up on certain tonations. Is the person under stress? You know, how are they vocalizing what they're talking about and analyzing that? Um, there's a broad spectrum of uses of that. You know, certainly on a business side, there's, there's plenty of, of areas we can do it. There's also things that you can do from a, you know, fun perspective, right? So as an example, um, I put in analysis of Abraham Lincoln, right? Took a Gettysburg Address, a couple of other things that Abraham Lincoln wrote, and then it came up and it described his character. And it was interesting, it actually matched. I mean, it was pretty fascinating because I was sitting here like, my gosh, this does describe him. And it wasn't so general, you're like, oh yeah, but that fits you know, 50 other people. It really didn't because it basically described him as the type of guy that would go out there and do things that other people, quite frankly, didn't have the gumption to do very much stood on his own, right? And there's not a lot of people like that, right? Especially in, in leadership positions. So I think um, there's a lot of power in that uh, arena. And we do, um, in, in LinkedIn, he had mentioned, I run a couple of different groups. We do talk about that on the Watson IoT LinkedIn group I run. And I also run a New York City uh, meetup as well around that type of technology. We do demonstrations and kind of dive into the code. But I think these are you know, more subtle areas that don't get as much publicity, right, as, as some of the other areas that, quite frankly, could end up being you know, pretty powerful at the end of the day. I'll jump on your, so I know your group well and what you do. Um, and you're right, the IoT plus AI, it's gonna be so powerful because you now can get a different view on the world in real time, cheaply. Um, you add that in with exactly how Watson works, you can suddenly ask very different questions. You ask a new question, you start developing a new AI system, you have a new algorithm, and then you have a new question. So um, back to the gentleman, I think there are 
lots of developments happening. Um, you just need to look wider. So um, IoT is going to be absolutely is going to be dramatic, and uh, doing some great work. So. Yeah, I think oh. that's uh, just a, a further comment on that very quickly on the IoT side. That's a huge market by itself, right? And when you combine that with AI, which pretty much, you know, whether it's Mark Cuban, Bill Gates, I mean, the nice thing about AI, right, there isn't too many people going, oh yeah, that's not important, right? I mean, it, it's one of the few areas, I mean, even back when the internet first launched, let me tell you, there were people that weren't buying into that, particularly on the commerce side. I mean, I have stories I could share with you, and it's, it's horrifying, but, Long story short, on the AI side, you're not seeing that. All the, all the top folks out there are all like, yep, this stuff is coming. Uh, and they're all on board with it in terms of where it's going and the potential power and the growth of that area. So I think the two combined really is, is a good point. Question. I, would, I would add too that. Question. Uh, well, I was going to say, I don't, I don't think ahead. IoT will be truly useful until we can apply AI to it. I mean, if you think about information, we have a theory about information. There's really three ways that we interact with interma uh, information. We collect it, we create it, we consume it. So IoT is all about collecting information about the world around you. AI creates models to make that information useful, and then robots consume those models and perform actions in the world. So I think the three of those things really need to work together to be truly effective in shaping the world that we all talk about as kind of the future we want to live in. The best example of that is that home IoT has been kind of a dud until Echo came around. Mm. Yeah. And the only reason why the Amazon Echo works is because it has natural language processing, deep learning. Um, until that, it didn't, home IoT was kind of boring. It was lights and other weird I'd say, things. I'd say the industrial application is even bigger yeah. at the moment. Um, you look at what uh, British Petroleum are doing in terms of, um, uh, they've now got IoT and fiber optics over every single cable every single pipe and every single piece of machinery. Um, the impact in the last two years has been gigantic. The cost saving is through the roof. It's not sexy, but makes a lot of money. James, you made a point earlier, one of your questions was the difference between creating content and the inquiries, and it's touching a little bit about what Doug was saying. You want to elaborate on your thoughts on that area of where we're going? Yeah, um, I guess you know, all the great AI stuff the software we have uh, is reaping the rewards of basically inference or inferencing, which is you give it a question and it comes out with an answer. The AI's job is to provide supply and answer. Um, but a lot of human value is actually in creativity, you know, writing articles, writing research reports, um, writing poetry, doing, doing uh, graphic design. Um, and AI has kind of skirted with that, but hasn't done really too much because uh, normally, it's very simple procedural graphics or something very that you have very little control over, and it's not very production ready. Um, the, the latest kind of geeky AI breakthrough in terms of algorithms, you know, everything in vision basically came out of this algorithm called a convolutional neural net. Um, in 2014, this new algorithm came out, it's still in the deep learning realm, called an adversarial generative network, mm -hmm. a generative adversarial network. And this is basically uh, the, the, the same problem reversed. So instead of asking, uh, what's in the picture, it's a cat. You say, draw me a cat, it draws you a cat. And it's been trained on a thousand cat photos. Um, I was just scanning my Twitter feed and, and someone just trained, uh, it, it, you know, you can train it on bedrooms and it will generate new bedrooms with really high fidelity. So if you think about productivity apps like Microsoft that supplies or that Adobe supplies, um, uh, you know, right now if, if I ask the graphic designer, I have to do a brochure, please, do a, 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 find me a photo of New York. You know, you, you're, you're in the business of, of looking at stock photographs or maybe creating original content, very expensive. With AI, you, you really kind of turn on the superpowers for the, for, the, for the content creator. You can literally tell Adobe Photoshop, give me a city landscape. It's been trained on the whole corpus of city landscapes from Paris to New York to Beijing. And it will generate something completely original. It would do it in a fraction of a second. Um, you can use, you can combine that with natural language processing and say, oh, give, it, give me night time and it would understand night and it would render that with night time. And you could basically do variations and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, in terms of reimagining as well as creating new categories of applications that have AI as an assumption rather than as this kind of, uh, oh, this new technology came around. Like, uh, I feel like, especially probably in Heather's domain, um, uh, there's a, I would, if I were doing a, a software startup, I would be trying to marry uh, new, u new user experience, user interfaces that, that has AI as an assumption. Um, it's kind of like when higher, higher level programming came along, you want to use the higher level stuff, you don't want to use the old stuff. 
Thank you, James. Yes, sir. All right, so the question I want to ask is, since this is the disruptive technologist meeting, um, how are major industries or new industries going to be formed out of this disruption within the next five years? And we picked on the car because looking at the car, 80% of it disappeared. So 80% of the jobs are gone. All right, we have, the, and, we have the question. Right, right. So the question is, just as that has been disrupted dramatically, who, how will the auto industry look? How will the retail industry look? Will the doctor be doing the same thing? They're not all going to be researching cancer. When you go to a doctor, you're going to see a different type of person, a different type of structure. And you're going to think about that. There's 14 <coughs> large pizzas sitting out there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Four minutes and then we're talking again. And, and how will pizza look? So four minutes. How will pizza look in five years? <laughs> More efficient. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Ish. So Oliver and Bruce, I want to involved a little bit here. You know, Oliver, I know what you do. You do a lot of consulting work, correct? And it's really futuristic type. Yeah. What are you looking at? What are some of the trends you're looking at? And then Bruce, if you could tie into how IBM looks at it from that perspective and give the audience some some views on that. What are just give us a global perspective when you're going into a client? What type of client are you talking to, and and what type of topics are there are out there at AI? So clients are everything from financial services companies, um, advertising, marketing, um, some medical, but not too much yet, um, airlines and so on. So it's the, the big boys, but also some uh, startups as well who are doing something interesting in, in AI. The first thing I do is, um, is ask what they know of, of AI and what they think they might need <clears throat> Normally the, uh, the answer is, hey, we need a bot. So I kind of quite quickly tell them, no, actually you don't need a bot. Um, what is it your company actually does? Which sounds quite straightforward, but uh, it, this conversation, if you're going to disrupt, doesn't start really with the technology. It starts with asking a new question. Um, and to ask a new question, you have to be pretty open about what you do, what you do well, um, what may be a a who a customer actually is. What do they actually do? What is a product? What does it actually need to be doing? Um, so to give you an, a, an example, there's uh, a project with an airline, I can't tell you who, um, which is thinking about flight. So how could we get rid of a jet lag entirely? How could we have a hyper-personalized um, flight experience where we know exactly who you are what your preferences are, um, so that what you eat, what you drink, um, if you like to sleep, what else is going on in your life with that, during that flight that matters. Um, how can we rebuild an airline, rebuild um, airports, and so on. So a lot of it is future thinking, a lot of it is where could we be, um, but the technology always plays a secondary role. It's much more about asking a new question. That's how it's always be, right? I mean, the technology to, should adapt to the to the unknown question or yeah. to the question that's being asked, rather than the other way around. Just for the sake of technology being developed. Mm -hmm. Bruce, your thoughts? Yes, I think when we talk to clients, a lot of it goes back to uh, BPM, so business process management. They're really looking at some core fundamentals. How do they improve their business in terms of productivity? So a lot of times, the things they're looking at to the average person, oh, this is kind of mundane. It's kind of boring. But it's all that stuff, like as an example in supply chain. So we recently worked with uh, Walmart doing uh, supply chain management and we incorporated blockchain as well as IoT and AI all in one. Um, so it's, it's really in that sense, they look at their core business and figure out where do we need to improve, right? Whether it's a timing issue, whether it's uh, you know productivity, uh, or they may just have a problem, right? And, and traditionally, if you look at technology, how is technology leveraged? It's usually leveraged to address a problem, typically, or on the other side, just a pure production, productivity, speed type mm -hmm. of, of scenario. So that's really where the conversation started. It isn't, it isn't always, although they do mention chatbots, which, which is pretty funny, actually, but um, it isn't like they, they come into the meeting where they're looking for some pie in the sky type of thing necessarily. They've got serious problems that they're trying to address for their business. And what they're trying to figure out is do you have another tool in the toolkit 
that will help address that and, and rectify it. It really is sometimes that simplistic, although the problems are never simplistic, right? They're always you know, complicated. Are you finding it some, um, most clients come to you saying we want something faster and cheaper, but not necessarily smarter? Uh, so definitely the, the, the faster comes into play, uh, cost savings is another one. I mean, those are the two main parameters. So yes, typically it isn't necessarily, they're coming at it from the angle of, hey, we want something smarter. Now, you know, that ends up being a lot of times a byproduct because if we're implementing AI, you are getting a smarter overall ecosystem. And so we explain that to them. Uh, but no, it's more about these practical things of business, right? How, how do we increase our revenue? How do we increase our profits? These are certain fundamentals in business I don't think are going to go away. I don't care whether it's AI or blockchain or IoT or whatever you have. Those, those things aren't going to change. So they still have to grapple I'd with that. I'd say some of the fundamentals absolutely won't change. And yet, there's a lot of companies out there who are blockbuster and they don't realize it. And they're doing the same thing quicker, cheaper. But they're blockbuster and they'll find that one day they are turned out. That's it. And uh, I think that's where what AI will be doing to a lot of companies soon. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that I agree with. I think there will be definitely disruptors in the marketplace and those disruptors are going to do it by just using, leveraging this new technology where other companies may stay in their kind of standard motif and mode and not get out of it. That's why, and this is you know an example to go back to everything that we can relate to now that's older technology, right? When the internet emerged in e-commerce, I know I was in the forefront of that and I was out there pushing clients, hey, get on this stuff. But we had clients that were like, man, eh, I got brick and mortar stores. I really don't need a single storefront on the internet. What in the hell would I need that for? You know, so there is gonna be those laggards that aren't gonna see it uh, for whatever reason or they don't want to invest and they will find they're gonna have issues. James, I wanna to talk to you, maybe you could, your, your white paper, is, can you let the audience know how they could access that? Is that something they can access? Sure, it's, uh, it's completely publicly available. Um, the a company's website is ARK Invest, uh, so A-R-K dash uh, invest.com. Um, I think the I think actually if people want to learn more about uh, AI, uh, the, Twitter is actually the best community. Twitter has kind of absorbed the smartest, I'd say, you know, subgenres of, 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 of a lot of, of what's happening right now. It's, it's the best community for AI, it's the best community for blockchain. There's actually a great healthcare community there. Of course, designers, programmers, and so forth. So I'm on Twitter, follow me if you like. Um, there, there's a, that's, that's a great way to learn. Great. Doug, uh, one point I would like to ask you that you had raised was, you know, the non-tech companies out there, you know, what, the, what are they going to need to do to move closer to at least start evaluating the AI component that's out there? Yeah, I think we had a question maybe similar to that earlier. Um, and we talked a little bit about what's the UI look like, I think, when you're developing AI. I think for a lot of companies, uh, humans might actually be the UI layer between AI and the end customer. So like if you think about financial services, right, or accounting, um, all those numbers driven professions are gonna be done by computers in the future. The people that then deliver what the computers spit out are gonna be very empathetic <coughs> humans that understand human nature, but probably don't know that much about accounting or finance, right? So I think that's the future of where a lot of these traditional professions go is Humans just need to understand how to be good humans and interact with one another, which I think in some ways is a really good thing, um, and then deliver this information that machines have with a human touch. So I think in some ways that's, that's probably the future of where a lot of old tech, non-tech companies need to go is they need to hire people that are good customer service reps rather than... Especially true in healthcare, right? I right. Mean, healthcare Watson same. is an example. Uh, the recent profile of IBM Watson that came out, you know, has had a mix of good and, and, and not so good. The good part is that uh, it's Watson turns out to be Watson for oncology turns out to be most effective in uh, rural areas or poorer countries. It's in a way, it's kind of classic low end disruption. It's not as good as a human, but it's 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 low end doctor, low end oncologist. So the most popular place Watson gets used is in Mongolia. Mm. Um, so I think that's actually a, a great. Bruce, you confirm that? Well, yeah, so it, it, it's, yeah, I think from that perspective, it, it, if we look at that, um, you know, 
how this stuff is going to grow and, and I do think it is in these more rural areas, particularly when it comes to healthcare, having patients be able to have access to some level of medical support, right, I think is, is going to be important and AI is a way to kind of uh, implement that and get that job done. But quite frankly, I mean, you know, as, as these systems become more and more proficient, they're going to be powerful for us as well. I mean, I don't know how many people in this room, but I don't know, it was probably two years ago, I threw out my back, I tried to get an appointment with an orthopedic doctor, two month waiting list. I mean, ridiculous, right? So I think at the end of the day, we could all use something where we can get better access to healthcare and have that sort of level of intelligence. But I also agree with the well, human- Can I interrupt? Yep. So what would your solution be there then? How would you, well, for you to wait two weeks or what would be the alternative? <laughs> I'd, I'd be, I'm not trying to be facetious, I'd, just, I'd like to know the answer. Well, I mean, I think, I think the answer is, right, so part of it, when you go to a doctor, right, so I, again, I'll just relate to my personal experiences. You go sometimes, a lot of times you already know what you have, right? It's, oh, I got strep throat or my back's thrown out, right? I know it's a muscle or no, I know I got a herniated disc, right? I already know what the problem is. But maybe I need a prescription for physical therapy, right? Or I need, I don't know, whatever, some other type of medication, right? If, it, if it's strep throat, maybe I need an antibiotic. But now I gotta wait a week to get in and see a doctor. Well, well, that's ridiculous, right? So if we had some type of remote diagnostic tools where we could actually do this through AI that would analyze and say, okay, you know, we've had this interface wow. with the patient, they've answered these questions. And you can ask questions to people, right, where they're not gonna know, right, how to answer, because you could always game systems, right? So this gets in the whole game theory and how you wanna go and analyze stuff, but you could do it in such a way that the patient does, you end up, yep, they're a valid patient, they really do have this disease, right? You could do back to the visual, open your throat, flashlight in there, take a picture of the back of your throat, yep, he's got strep throat. So I mean, these things are all solvable, right? If you break them out into little bite-sized pieces. So that's what I think I, I would assume, be advocating. I assume, I assume you're to sign a waiver for the uh, for the pharmacist and stuff like that. that <laughs> I would. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, sir. We have a question in the back. You, oh, I'm sorry. You're telling me you give me the hook. And, um, you took you took away four minutes of my time. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, we have to ask Bruce where the fireside chat is going to be. <clears throat> Radio City Room, at the end of the hall. The very end of the hall. Very end of the hall. And sure. There's three large pizzas that are going to be delivered there. <laughs> <laughs> and, but every one of you is going to get two slices of one of the pizzas because you guys couldn't leave your seats. So um, yeah. So let me. Let me so sorry. Would you? One word. So the word is education. All right. Discuss amongst yourselves. Yeah. Discuss, right. discuss amongst yourselves. All right. So I just want to give the audience, uh, give the panel, one takeaway that you want the audience to know about. If you can keep it to 30 seconds, and we'll wrap this up. Well, we were actually just talking about education before um, and how STEM is very big, but how do we bring in the arts? STEAM is now a big thing in education, where the A being arts. And how far do we want to have that be in technology? Do we, we were just talking about there's a, an app that will let you create music, but does it, it doesn't have that necessary like soul that you hear behind um, songs. So it could be good for a soundtrack, but it might not be good for an actual, if you're listening to it every day. Um, so figuring out in education, how can we bring in the more creative folks and tell and let them know that there's this place for them in technology that like without these subject matter experts uh, who are creative and um, who have this experience, uh, there's a place for them. Like we need to know what they want because as a software developer, you unless you have that, you won't be able to create a good pro product without them. So that's, I think, an important way to go with bringing in the arts. Thank you. I think we should realize that we're in a really interesting time right now, um, somewhat unique. We have access to some incredible AI, a lot of data. We can ask any question we like of that AI, of that data. I think we've all got to decide what we want to do with it, um, how creative we can be, and what we want to solve. What, how do we want to make the world better somehow? Um, if we're going to disrupt, let's do interesting things, let's do exciting things, and let's fundamentally change our lives. And I think uh, now's the right time to do it. Thank you. 
Bruce? So the, the point I would bring up that we haven't really talked about is that I don't think that AI allows you know mankind to become sort of the global village idiot. And what I mean by that is that you know people are going to sit there and look at AI and go, oh, this machine's so smart now that if it says you know the sky is is you know I don't know yellow. And in fact, you look up and it's blue, that doesn't mean you believe the computer, right? So I think historically, when people look at data or information that's produced historically in a report, could be on a you know, screen or printed out, people look at it and go, wait a minute, this number seems off. Why do they do that, right? Well, because they know it's the machine in the background is cranking something out, it's using an algorithm, it's using a certain data set, right? It could be sales they're analyzing as an example. And people will question it because, well, maybe everybody didn't put in their data, right? Or maybe the algorithm's wrong. But I just think, you know, caution people just because it's AI, don't fall into that fallacy that because it tells you the answer is A, that, that it is A, right? You should always, Double check, look at what the answers are coming out, uh, and make sure that you're still in the game. Because I don't think you know AI is not meant to again replace people. It's meant to augment, supplement, speed up, blah blah blah. So I think that's an important. I point. think it's an important message for the common person to understand because I'm sure as many people be frightened of that that, that concept. James. Yeah, I mean, very simply, I would say that um, the big difference now is in the future, every, everywhere there's a camera, there's going to be intelligent software that understands what it sees. Um, and everywhere there's a microphone, there's going to be intelligent software that understands what it hears. Um, and just those two things alone, scaled to every internet device, is going to be uh, dramatically impactful. Thank you. Doug, wrap us up. In 10 years, every company will have to be an AI company or they won't be competitive. The education question, the answer is the human skills that are monetizable in the future creativity, empathy, community, that's it. That's the long-term to medium-term thing we need to focus on in education. Great, thank you. Let's uh, give a round of applause to this panel. Thank you. <laughs> Lauren, another great topic. Thank you again for the opportunity. All right, and I'm gonna thank Kevin for, for being our moderator. Uh, we do have our fireside chat. Now, for anybody who can't make the fireside chat, um, let me just mention something. There is an article called Artificial Intelligence is About the People, Not the Machines. Okay, that is a takeaway message uh, that Bruce asked me to make sure everybody gets. So just Google it. Intelligence, Artificial Intelligence is About the People, Not the Machines. And with that, uh, go follow Bruce. Go have a fireside chat if you can't make it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And we will see you next time. Good night. Can you come this with me? Sorry.